It's always great to find something new out there that you just know within minutes is going to be on your list of favorite things ever in short order. I missed the hype on Outer Wilds initially. Whatever kind of hype an artsy, abstract, self-driven game like this gets, it was something I simply hadn't heard about until it was out and people were playing and making videos on it already. Just from the buzzings I had heard about the game in the lead up to my finally playing it at the end of 2019, I was pretty well convinced it was exactly the kind of game that I would love, and it being a puzzle and exploration game centered around deciphering and understanding strange foreign or ancient technology spread across the celestial bodies of a solar system, well if you've been following this channel especially recently then it shouldn't really be a long trip to see why. The game isn't exactly cagey with its best features. It's the kind of thing you could pick any number of things to hold up as a high point of the experience. Many of them will be made clear from the outset. The aesthetic design, the music, the concept, or just the fact that it might be the best, truest, and most honest atmospheric puzzle game I may have ever played. Only with a distinct lack of atmosphere. <laughs> So perhaps you can see a pattern emerging, and hopefully you are aware of how much I love these types of games. Indeed, this video is the fourth and as of now final planned installment of the puzzle game series that I have been working on and alluding to periodically. I've been so excited to get to this game as it's not unrealistic to say that playing Outer Wilds is probably what convinced me to come back to YouTube after the hiatus I was on in 2018 and 19. It was such an unbelievable mix of all of the things I love about the genre that I kind of couldn't believe that it was a game that I was playing. These kinds of games have been with me basically ever since I first played Myst, all the way back in, by my best estimate, 1995. It was a game that shaped so many of the ways in which I approach and think about video games even to this day. In fact, so much of what struck me about Outer Wilds draws me back to those early experiences and the games in the genre that followed. I really get into these kinds of cerebral puzzle games, by which I mean a game that is just there in front of you, giving you everything you need to know to progress, with the challenge being based purely in what you notice, and how you are able to connect the concepts presented in this way to answer yeah. questions. Games like Myst, Riven, and The Witness, all games that I've written about recently, are experiences that value a distinct sense of place, and specifically what you can learn about that place as a centerpiece of their mechanical appeal. They reward, first and foremost, observation and understanding as their central method of gameplay, with puzzles hidden in the world in such a way that they start to blur the lines between mechanic and aesthetic. Progress only happens when the player's drive to expand on what they are learning or discovering takes over. And much like my experience with The Witness that I described in my last video, first firing up Outer Wilds had such a strange and powerful effect on me in the context of my past obsession with Myst. But where I was at first disappointed and dismayed that The Witness was not enough, like Myst or Riven, Outer Wilds instead shocked me by how much it came off as the perfect extension and realization of those games that I know and love. In Outer Wilds, as is often the case for games like this, you play as an unnamed avatar character, a Hearthian, as in an individual from the planet of Timberhearth. You have just been inducted into the Outer Wilds Ventures space program, whose goal is to explore the local solar system, consisting of four-ish planets, a series of moons, a comet, and an anomaly, which we'll discuss later, that are all there waiting to be explored. But before we can get to all of that, there's a bunch of practical stuff to take care of first. We wake up on the morning of our first launch, and apparently we're so excited to get going that we forgot the launch codes. As we make our way through town to acquire them, we get a chance to wander around the quiet little hamlet we call home, get to know some of the other Hearthians, and get some prep time in for our journey. We can practice navigating in zero gravity, practice flying a mini version of our spaceship, and try out using our various tools, such as a signal scope that detects and tracks, of all things, signals, and an ancient language translator that will come very much in handy later on. Our errands take us through a museum put together by the space program with exhibits explaining the concepts of gravity, the life cycle of stars, some more of the equipment we will be using, a rock that serves as an example of quantum uncertainty, you know, it moves around when you're not looking at it, and finishing off with a map of the solar system up in the observatory. This is also where we will learn about the Nomai, a species of extraterrestrial life now long extinct that by all accounts appear to have inhabited our solar system sometime before we did. We can learn about their technologies, their writing, and see some of their artifacts brought back for study. 
The big note of this part of the game, though, is when we finally get our launch codes and try to get going on our way, we are held up briefly for something of an odd encounter. One of the Nomai artifacts, a statue displayed in the front entrance, turns to look at us, and seems to be really staring into our soul as memories from the day so far whip past before our eyes, and then, nothing. Everyone agrees that what happened was indeed strange, but don't really know what, if anything, it means. And hey, everything seems fine, so let's think about it later and get back to business. We head back down to the launch pad, buckle up into the pilot's chair, and blast off into the stars. A thing that, I promise you, never gets old. From this point onwards, there is no set path for the player to follow, at least not one that is obvious. The play of the game is now essentially entirely player-directed, with the game really only offering suggestions on where to go next that are totally missable. There are a series of branching breadcrumb trails that, if followed, will open up the point of the game to the player, but they could just as easily breeze right past them, and that's fine, actually. They won't really be any poorer for doing so, because going to any one place in the solar system, even from the word go, is likely to result in a discovery that will coax the game forward, even if only spiritually. There is a lot to see and do in Outer Wilds. Each of the celestial bodies we can land on is a totally different experience. Everything from the size of it, to the terrain type, even the difference in gravity changes how we move around and explore our new environments and it is really cool to see what there is out here in space. Just taking it all in at first is kind of a tall task because of the open-ended progress of the game. The solar system needs exploring, and we've got nothing but time on our hands. Pretty much anywhere the player ends up in this game, there is a high chance they will start to realize to what degree the Nomai had set themselves up in the solar system. Their ruins and settlements can be found pretty much everywhere. Even just a quick hop over the horizon on the tiny rock in space we call home leads us to a huge mining operation the Nomai conducted on our planet long ago. In some places, it might be harder to find exactly where this kind of stuff is located, and in others it's hard to know where to even start, or when to realize you've seen it all. Places like Ember Twin or Brittle Hollow are so vast in this regard, I was scared to miss the little details that might make for good talking points when I was replaying this game for footage. This is in contrast to a place like Giant's Deep, or <laughs> Dark Bramble, which both have a few things for you to find and engage with, but just in flying around them for the first time, they would be easy to miss, or not be able to properly navigate, for reasons. Now, I understand how comparing games to other games might seem, and probably is, kind of reductive in the wider conversation, but the prospect of playing something new that can really and truly fit into the same kind of experience as playing a game like Myst, Riven, or The Witness for the first time is like catnip to me. If, like, like, if I was a cat, I mean. The mechanical proximity to these old favorites of mine is the primary reason this game sunk into my brain the way it did. This is why I'm doing this series on puzzle games. There is something about the idea of a game letting the mechanical pull of play happen in the mind of the player as opposed to being stated on the screen or logged as a flagged objective of some kind that amplifies the magic of games for me. There are plenty of ways to hit you with that shot of empowerment that only games can, but I have to admire the deeper connection that I feel these games present, and what they could be saying through it. My case study for this so far has been, again, Mist, Riven, and The Witness, which are all games that take different approaches to reaching across the gap between screen and mind to really get into the heads of their players. Outer Wilds follows up on all of the methods employed by these games, which is pretty amazing to me. It is a game that presents a massive series of puzzles to solve within the culmination of technology or systems that are foreign to the player, just like Mist. It portrays a culture and people developing a place, molding it around the space that they find themselves in, an understanding of which offers deeper insights into the play of the game, and that the puzzles are in practice part of a single larger truth, just like Riven. It is a game that drip feeds its revelations to the player through a burgeoning understanding of a unified system or language that unfolds as the player continues to engage with it, de-abstracting concepts or ideas contained in the game space, just like The Witness. Most important of all, it makes it clear over time that you are able to complete your adventure exclusively with the tools you begin the game with, which I think is the most important aspect of games like this. I might have expected Outer Wilds to manage 
one of these things well, but the fact that it takes all four of these angles and turns them into one unifying through line that ties this massive sweeping excursion into one experience, I, I almost can't believe it. It's the kind of game that puts its huge revelations in the same mode of play as the cool little details, that lets the significance of the moment be a realization rather than a screen prompt. It so expertly weaves its narrative into the mechanical progression of the game that at times I didn't realize the importance of what I was reading without really thinking about it afterwards. I really love this game, and many of the reasons why lie in the differences between it and my old favorites. But before we get into the more granular points of those differences, first we need to address what is probably the major mitigating factor of this game. The sun goes supernova and destroys everything. It happens 22 minutes into the game, and there's no way to stop it. But wouldn't you know, all of a sudden, all of our memories of everything we've done so far in the game once again fly past our awareness, until it seems like everything we've known since waking up flies away from us and everything goes black. Where we then wake up. Again. That's right, we have stumbled into a time loop situation, which is surprising. The smart money is on it having something to do with the Nomai statue that looked at us at the start of our journey. We wake up again back at our campsite at the bottom of the launch pad, this time remembering the launch codes, and the day is once again ours to seize. This is where the major fulcrum on which the game operates reveals itself to us. If you've ever seen Groundhog Day, Palm Springs, Russian Doll, or Edge of Tomorrow, to name a few examples, this is one of those. Every 22 minutes, your progress resets and you need to start again. From here we have our main source of adversity, maybe the biggest adversity ever. The sun is exploding, and for some reason, something the Nomai have done or are doing is allowing us to skirt the edges of disaster so maybe we can do something about it. Where the exploration in a game like Mist or Riven is based solely on wandering around a place and seeing what you notice over time, the exploration of Outer Wilds is a bit less cryptic, as it rests in two distinct paradigms. The first is in how each world you visit is very clearly defined and designed, instantly recognizable and presenting unique challenges for the player to navigate. Everything from an ocean planet covered in cyclone windstorms, or a volcanic moon pelting the planet below with giant lava balls, all the way up to what looks like what was once a planet, but was torn apart by a malignant growth of some sort. That seems to be spreading to other places? Yeah, we're still not talking about this yet. There is also a strange and mysterious substance called ghost matter that exists just about everywhere in the solar system. Pockets of the stuff will have accumulated into deposits, and at times will block your path. It doesn't look like much, but it will do a lot of damage very quickly if you aren't using your equipment to figure out how to navigate the situation. Your immediate concern, pretty much everywhere you go, is figuring out how to travel in these environments and how to move safely around or through the various hazards you encounter that these ecosystems present. Everything that happens in the space of the game, as in space, is on the same 22 minute timer as the sun. Like the orbit of the planets, the natural processes of those planets are not static. The sand funneling over to Ember Twin slowly filling up the cave system, or Brittle Hollow slowly collapsing into that big scary black hole at its center are progressive events. The state of the game at the beginning of the loop is not the same as at the end. Danger is the first major departure from the standard I'm approaching this game from, and the supernova is not the only way to restart the time loop, if you know what I mean. Any and all peril found in Mist and Riven was always scripted, part of a plot that unfolds as you play, but in Outer Wilds it's totally up to the situation you find yourself in. Pretty much anywhere you go, there is the potential for some pretty horrifying outcomes. Obviously the solar system needs to be appropriately sized for a game played in 22 minute increments. The planets are usually less than a minute's travel between them, and like, 
this view here clocks the sun at being 40 kilometers away, which, you know, isn't really to scale with reality. The solar system is small, but the vastness of the physical space of the game and the nature of it is not lost on the experience. In addition to the plentiful dangerous planet side, I never fully realized how terrifying the prospect of an endless void really was. Especially when, ugh, how do you not look down when down is literally any direction you choose? It's just kind of there, waiting to swallow you up. This is what led to my aesthetic and emotional attachment to our spaceship in the game. The cobbled together mishmash of equipment that is our little vessel was like a security blanket for me in the face of all of the dangers on the planets and the big scary nothing out there. By all accounts, it is the closest thing we have to a home in this game, as even back on Timberhearth, none of the houses are presented as ours. With its slightly cramped interior, though some might call it cozy, its wood-based construction, the posters and life-saving equipment packed onto the wall space, the roughshod way we hang our spacesuit when it's not in use, it's where our adventure begins every time we begin it. It's one of the few places we can definitely feel safe in this game, that shields us from the horrifying nothing out there. The few times I actually had to exit my ship to make repairs in the dead of space was always kind of harrowing, both thrilling and terrifying. I really loved these moments, even though I could never get back inside fast enough. Maybe this is why I still haven't watched Gravity? It's stuff like this that really pulls me into a game. In my mind, this game would have been so much weaker if it was just us flying between planets in a souped-up spacesuit that we could launch off of the ground at any time in, or if our ship was essentially a menu select screen that just teleports you between places. The ship's very movement and function is specifically what empowers us, because when it's gone, you're screwed. Or at least you will have to get really creative in fixing the situation. Even the presence of normal gravity in our ship is an element of the game that grounds us, pun intended, in familiarity. And the fact that there is an in-universe explanation for that gravity, specifically a Nomai gravity crystal, the same kind we have seen defying the basic laws of the universe out and around in our travels, repurposed for our ship, might seem ultimately meaningless just to look at, but to me, it does a lot in this context. It would have been a perfectly fine logical concession in a game like this to say, of course you'd have gravity in your ship, because why not? It, it's what ships do. Just make the ship have gravity. But this offers that deeper connection that we can make, both furthering the feeling of cozy security our ship provides within the game's own reality, and establishing an understanding that the rules are the rules, and there are no special exceptions for the player. We are just as much a part of the cold, uncaring universe as any planet, meteor, or moon out there. Without this crystal, we would be drifting around our ship just like out there in space, which expands nicely into the knowledge that, again, without our ship, we're screwed. There's nothing quite like standing on a planet in this game with your ship destroyed or removed or on the other side of the solar system, realizing how disempowered we are in the natural state of the game. It is simultaneously the thing that grounds us and, in effect, underlines much of the terror of the game. It's just on the other side of these walls. Each cycle we play through is our opportunity to learn something new. What starts out as surface exploration of planets, their landscapes, natural phenomena, and where that pesky ghost matter is eventually turns into knowing what changes throughout the cycle, where to go in those places to find the points of interest, and after that, where the shortcuts are that make subsequent trips faster. The best lesson to learn here is that knowing how and when to access information in this game is as important as what that information is. And this is the second of those exploration paradigms I mentioned before, the finding and examining of the various Nomai ruins, what is left of their society and culture that we can observe. Spread throughout the solar system are ruined settlements, abandoned cities, and at times still functioning infrastructure that is all worth exploring for its own reasons. All of these places feature a piece of Nomai writing for you to use your translator on, rather than just a note or journal like you might find in Mist or Riven, or an audio log like what has become quite popular in games of recent decades. The majority of what the Nomai have left for us are their correspondences, like a series of letters or a chat room thread. 
they are arranged in branching paths, showing how a conversation between the two, three, or more individuals involved, or even the train of thought of a single writer, moves or breaks off into tangents. No idea why so much of it is written down on the walls, but you know what? I I'm not going to question what works. Examining their homes, laboratories, and infrastructure will lead to discoveries that provide new understandings about what is around us and what is going on. This is where we will find our puzzle pieces, which really are just pieces of information you gather from your research. Figuring out the deal with the supernova and the time loop is implicitly our main objective, and there isn't much in the progression of the game that doesn't tie into that process. If we do our research, then maybe we can find an answer to a question that seems overwhelmingly unanswerable. And now is what I need to tell anyone who hasn't played this game yet to go and do that now. Of course it's ultimately up to you, but fair warning. Here is where we're going to start talking about a lot of the story stuff in this game, which makes up a lot of what you would call the spoiler material here. So, here we go, but uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Over time, you will come to learn that the Nomai are normally a nomadic people, wandering through space looking for things to learn and add to their base of knowledge. When they suddenly detected a signal that seemed to be older than the universe itself, and if you're wondering how that's possible, well so were they, they changed course to get as close to it as possible, and this snap decision caused them to crash land in our solar system. The survivors on the escape pods that were released started to set up shop at the locations they landed at. Between building a home for themselves, studying the places they'd found themselves in, and researching the various quantum objects they found scattered about the place, they never stopped theorizing about how to find the source of that signal that brought them there, what they would come to call the Eye of the Universe it becoming something of an obsession for them, scientifically, philosophically, even eventually becoming sacred, almost in a religious sense. All of this backstory, the places that it goes to afterwards, and how it ties so tightly into the process of answering the questions at hand, is the foundation of what makes this game shine. It's kind of staggering how much gets taken care of by the simple act of reading. I'm not saying that Mist or Riven phoned it in in this regard, the journals that you read in those games are aesthetically appropriate, with the Mist series kind of being about books, and they are well written and fleshed out, offering great backstory and world building, but that's kind of it. They are largely optional, only occasionally offering actionable knowledge that leads to progress. The backstory and the motion of the game are essentially kept in two separate spaces in those games, and that's pretty much the point. I have talked before about how Mist and Riven are very story light. There is lots to learn about in those worlds, and there are some situations that unfold as you progress in these games, but for the most part, the play is not affected by events or character actions. It can carry on at its own pace, at your pace, leaving the deeper lore and story up to you to take in at your leisure. Outer Wilds is the same method. No one is doing anything to drive the story, and nothing is actively happening in any kind of plot. Everything the game needs to have in place for it to be played is there from the get-go, and totally accessible from the very beginning if you're lucky or already know what's going on. There is nothing out there that is trying to hurt or stop you, with, like, one exception still just a force of nature in the grand scheme of things. The most villainous thing we come across in these games are locked doors that the Nomai didn't think to leave unlocked before going extinct that require us to take the long way around. Also the ghost matter, but that's basically on the same level as the locked doors, though considerably more deadly. There are other people you can talk to. The other explorers of the Outer Wilds Ventures program are located throughout the solar system with their campfires and marshmallows at the ready, but they are there pretty specifically to bounce ideas off of, and at times maybe nudge you in the direction of a revelation. The secrets of the game are hidden equally among the landscapes and nature you find around the solar system, the intact technologies of the Nomai, and the specific context offered by the writings they left behind. Things like the scientific endeavors they had in mind and were working on, the games they played together as children, and even their personal relationships with each other all play into, to one degree or another, the demystifying of this game. Who does or doesn't get along with whom? Who has to make the difficult decisions in weird situations? Who are the known jokesters, even revealing attraction and coupling between Nomai just as a matter of the discussion we are reading? 
It's almost akin to what you will find in an Ace Attorney or Danganronpa or any other game that lives and dies by its characters. The mystery, as in the objectives of the game, is deconstructed and itemized for you, but hidden in the midst of the game's top-notch characterization and at times its environmental design only with the hands-off approach of Mist or Riven. The Nomai are effectively part of the background noise of what is going on, like the journals in the aforementioned games, and much of what they say can be filtered away, leaving only the important stuff, but reading the way that they are always acutely aware of the personalities they are writing to or about turns what in other games might have been purely informational game writing with a touch of narrative sprinkled onto it into a sort of character study of people who aren't here who have everything to do with what is happening to us right now. This is how Outer Wilds accomplishes that blurring of the lines between mechanics and aesthetic. The act of playing the game will provide you with the whole picture of the Nomai as a people while also driving the mechanical engagement of the game forwards, almost the perfect realization of what Mist attempted 25 years beforehand. So what is it they did? Why is our current predicament true? Well, in a moment of serendipitous discovery, the Nomai noticed a strange quirk of the black hole warp technology they had developed for moving equipment and people long distances. It seemed as though when something or someone entered one side of the system, they would exit the other a split second beforehand. That's black holes for ya! They then figured out that with enough energy, this time difference could be amplified, causing something to exit a white hole noticeably before entering its corresponding black hole. So they conceived of the Ash Twin project, a multi-phase plan consisting of building a probe launching cannon that fires in a random direction, searching for the eye of the universe, then transmitting back whatever data it comes across. Then with the use of the sun station, that elusive little thing orbiting the sun directly, they would trigger a supernova, generating enough power to send a mechanism that stored memories and data back in time through a black hole a full 22 minutes so the data collected could be analyzed and if the Eye of the Universe had been located, then they could just switch off the process and let stuff carry on as usual. Pretty ingenious, right? This big revelation comes packaged with some of the game's best moments. Each of the Nomai we learn about becomes a lovingly rendered real character in that many of them are actively involved in bringing this whole thing together, and following them through the process is half of the fun. It's highly unlikely that the player is going to remember the sheer breadth of names with which they are presented throughout their readings, and I do want to stress, they don't have to. But there are moments that I hope will stick in people's minds. The fact that the probe launching module explodes when we wake up at the start of every loop means so much more when we find out that Privet accurately predicted exactly that happening because of who was in charge of that branch of the project. Reading a series of notes between Yarrow and Clary becomes absolutely adorable when they are interrupted by Poke, who tells them to stop using official channels to flirt with each other. There is a debate between Idea, Pi, Coleus, Poke, and Raimi that you can read, where they argue over the ethics and risks of using the sun of a solar system that might one day produce life of its own as an engine for what is essentially their vanity project. Solanum's anxiety about devotion to the cause of seeking the eye of the universe was a sobering reality check in and amongst all of the hell yeah excitement that we read about everywhere else. Reading Clary's final thoughts on the interloper shuttle expressing her anxiety and loneliness as her shipmates left to venture deeper into the caverns they found might be my new high watermark for how to blend conveying information to the player while amplifying the aesthetic effect of a story. And let me tell you, it is a special kind of gut-wrenching when it gets to the point of being able to actually identify whose remains you were looking at when you're just wandering around. There was a thought, a line, that I kept coming back to with this game even after I finished it. Something along the lines of, The Herthians and the Nomai may be separated by time, but they are united by space. It's one of those thoughts you get, but you don't really understand what you mean by them or maybe I'm the only one who gets those. Eventually it did condense down into something, and I'm gonna try to explain it here. The differences between the Herthians and the Nomai are obvious. Their technology is different. Their architecture is different. Their attitudes towards space travel are different. One of them is extinct in this part of the galaxy, the other is not. There is a deep valley separating them, but there is common ground between them that much of the nature of this game is based on. 
It's so easy to look at things like a ruined city or a piece of vast mysterious technology and think of the presence of the people that built it simply as an amorphous amalgam, just a concept in the aether that sets things in motion. But between the characterization we can get from all of our readings and the understanding that, like us, these advanced ancient people were nothing more than fragile, squishy creatures in the face of the vastness of space, the Nomai aren't just set dressing or story filler in this game. They are a constant reminder that in the face of everything we come across in our existence, we are the same. I felt a strong connection between the player and the Nomai throughout the progress of the game. In all of the times the writings we find warn us of the dangers present in any place if we're not careful or smart about our actions, there was a common experience. Problems and dangers that exist now existed then also. Working your way through the caves on Ember Twin takes on a strong commonality when reading the Nomai's directions, guiding travelers onwards, also warning them of the dangers of the rising sands in the cave and the scorching sun on the surface. The constant reminders to watch your footing lest you fall into the black hole on Brittle Hollow and the need to find shelter from the volcanic moon above are common problems shared by life here, no matter who that life is or when they are. To me, it is a kind of connecting thread between our Hearthian avatar, the other travelers of the Outer Wilds program, and their ancient benefactors. From how fragile we are in the face of a simple interaction of physics or movement gone wrong, to just trying to exist anywhere that isn't specially conditioned to support us, it's all the same to everyone. The galaxy has all of this, and our natural selves can be in like this much of it. There is a darkness hiding in this game that took some time to take root in my mind, even though it's kind of out there in plain sight. Sure, it is a game about researching a long extinct people while a supernova just won't stop happening, but for much of my first go around of this game I kind of fell into that amorphous amalgam view of the Nomai. All of what there was to see being just aesthetic design, probably. What's an ancient ruin without a few skeletons around, right? It's an easy enough thing to look past, as we have a goal in mind. Get in contact with whoever's controlling the Ash Twin project, or otherwise find a way to shut it off. Life continues on as normal, problem solved, it's a great feeling knowing where you're headed and what needs to happen. In spite of the unstructured nature of the game, I was in a position to be fully taken in by this path the game presented, and that's what happened. That is, until I started to confront how much danger and hostility the Nomai were, and by extension we are, exposed to just by being in the solar system. I started to ask why it is that the Nomai's remains are just scattered about, what it is that happens every time the loop resets, why ghost matter has so often collected in the ruined homes we find. I started to realize how much death we are surrounded by at any given time in this game. I am not sure I have ever played a game that so effectively placed the player against the natural state of planet, or just the forces of nature as its primary conflict before. There are plenty of times this kind of thing shows up as a thematic or narrative device, and yes, platformer characters are challenged by environment as much as any kind of active opposition in their games, I am aware, but I am talking specifically about how these worlds are simply content to carry on as usual, and if we or anyone else gets in the way, okay, fine. Have fun with that. The galaxy as a concept is at best indifferent to our existence, and at worst intrinsically misanthropic, and that's the point. For those of you who have followed my channel through the years, you know I love to find horror in unexpected places, but I don't think this existential horror in Outer Wilds is an accident. There are layers upon layers upon layers of death in this game that all came or come about in different ways and for different reasons, but ultimately, they are collective. They all lead to the same place. Maybe the most useful term for it would be an ending. Some of us just get there before others. The conflict is removed from any kind of defeatable focal point. 
The plot twists in the story, or at least what qualify as plot twists in this game, made me question not only my understanding of the story, but they challenged my biases and assumptions, making me wonder how I was interpreting it as a story at all. We're not going to shame the Hourglass Twins into not accidentally killing us or anyone else who gets caught in the sand call. We're not going to successfully petition a windstorm on Giant's Deep to stop it dropping an island on top of us. And we're not going to rise up and defeat a comet that might happen to drift into our pocket of space and quickly rupture, flooding the worlds and space around them with a new substance that will instantly extinguish all life in the solar system, leaving its remains where they stood. These things just kind of happen. I was always assuming the best, that there was an answer to the problem. Eventually I was going to achieve whatever counted as vengeance for the Nomai, however the game would allow. But it doesn't. At all. Ghost matter, as it is explained to us, is contracting and dissipating slowly, which implies that it was once much greater in amount, more spread out, and new evidence suggests it may have blanketed the entirety of the solar system at one time. It was like a punch to the face when the game stopped and told me, there floating in zero gravity, staring at the seed of the Nomai extinction at the center of the interloper, that the way I normally take in stories means nothing here. There is no justice for the Nomai, because who can say a crime was committed? There is nothing to do but remember and acknowledge them, something we will need to do quickly because the next haymaker this game throws, or at least the next thing it threw at me, was the jaw hit floor moment when we learned that the sun station didn't work. It never worked. The experiment failed, and it was never able to cause a supernova. Can't switch off what isn't turned on. That thing we have been railing against this whole time is suddenly not intentional, but natural and unstoppable. How would you go about stopping a star from dying? How do you stop all of the stars from dying? Yeah, perhaps you had a talk with Chert and they pointed out that the other stars in the sky were going supernova too. Maybe you caught a glimpse of it yourself when you happened to be gazing out into the patient and all-consuming night that is waiting out there for us. Maybe it suddenly makes sense why the game would draw our attention to the concept of the heat death of the universe. It's over. All of it. We can't save the day. The problem can't be solved. What right do we even have to call it a problem? It's just what was always meant to happen, happening. And this is to say nothing of whatever did this to what we now call Dark Bramble, which I mentioned before is spreading to our home planet. There are planet-eating parasites in this universe, and I have no doubt the Hearthians could relocate with only relative difficulty if it got out of control, but something as earth-shattering, literally earth-shattering, as the impermanence of something like a planet at the hands of a natural process is waiting there in the darkness for us, overshadowed only by the end of the universe. Even if there was life left to live here, we can look to the skies for a stark, defeating prophecy of where our planet's headed without intervention. The Nomai went extinct without reason or bargaining. Why shouldn't we? It seems like there's always something out there that wants to kill us. But that's a flawed statement. None of these things want to kill us. They just will. I owe a lot of this bleak outlook on the game to reading the 2011 book In the Dust of This Planet, Horror of Philosophy Volume 1 by Eugene Thacker at exactly the right time. Much of the book heads in a different direction entirely, but the framework established in the introduction shed a new light on this game for me. The simplified version is learning to understand the difference between the world, the earth, and the planet all of which are one and the same in terms of objects and yet entirely different when perceived by humanity. We struggle to understand the Earth acting and reacting of its own accord because we live and built our world on it. We're even less equipped to understand the planet we live on, one of billions in the universe, perhaps not even appreciably distinct on the grand scheme of things. The universe probably eats planets like ours for breakfast. This game has been showing us how futile all of this is over and over and over again. 
From the unceremonious ends we meet on our journey, to the matter-of-factness with which we could disappear at any moment. It's what the game has been telling us this whole time. We are fragile creatures, steps away from the great beyond at any given moment. We are the same as these mysterious people we learn about, and they went extinct. And while Thacker's argument is that horror fiction is humanity manifesting their morbid curiosity surrounding the idea of a world suddenly revealing itself to be not meant for them, Outer Wilds is content to just throw that harsh reality right at the player and let them deal with it. What originally came off as a game that was refreshingly non-violent suddenly was something else entirely. The concept of Earth is always looming over us in this game. The idea of planet is just a little further yet into the shadows, soon to be revealed. The great majority of the time this game allows the player to indulge the, for lack of a better term, humanized world, it looks like this. It's the quote I started this video with. We cannot help but to think of the world as a human world by virtue of the fact that it is we human beings that think it. This game draws all of my nihilistic tendencies, which I normally do a pretty good job of ignoring, out into the forefront. I've always liked the Carl Sagan quote, We are a way for the universe to know itself. I'm hardly the first person to apply that quote to this game, but for me it was kind of haunting. Knowing the universe in the context of this game is a reminder that one day there will be no more eyes and ears, no more sense of touch or smell. There won't be any way of processing or understanding what happened, what is happening, no way to wonder what will happen next. It will just be objects in space, unseen, unrecorded, unknown. When the last heart stops beating, how will the stars know that they are beautiful, even when they are dying? How does time know when to end? How will the universe know that once upon a time it was known? These seem like pointless, overly inflated questions to ask, but we might be the only ones to ever ask them. So we might as well. If there was ever going to be a game that broke me down into nothing like this, it would be one of these puzzle games. The ones that leave out the omniscient directing systems and changing game states. The kind of game that just leaves a player to their own devices. It's an environment that already gets my brain working more than most situations, which is already fertile ground for overthinking anything I'm presented with. All the way back to when Myst first showed me that a world and its systems didn't have to be a straight line. That they could be explored and understood just through a willingness to learn. Riven makes this understanding cultural, and The Witness makes it about the self. Outer Wilds does all of this, but positions it against the simple, but all-consuming, unconquerable question. What's the point? A question that I think is often instinctively answered very pessimistically. On a long enough timeline, maybe nothing has a point. It's something I myself am likely to fall into, despite how these are games perfectly positioned to simulate the idea of a player themselves being a force of and in the universe, to whatever degree the game is operating on. These are games that stick you in the midst of all kinds of unknowns and interconnections and whatever else have yous, and asks you to see what sense you can make out of it. What if consciousness is a force to rival gravity on the universal stage? What if sorting out and navigating the intricacies of the potential of what's around it could change the trajectory of everything? Outer Wilds seems to agree with this idea. It's something the game states outright. The quantum objects. Those nimble, teleporting curiosities you find scattered throughout your journey, which confounded and fascinated the Nomai long before us. Pieces of the world, rocks, trees, other random stuff we find in the solar system that make up the physical truth of space, all that uniquely react to the presence of a conscious observer. Almost like they know, they are known. What came off to me, and I'm sure to many others initially, as a cool and clever idea to create some interesting gameplay situations, eventually condensed into the kind of sentiment that followed me out of this game. These weird rocks are the universe looking back at us, at our characters, almost like it's saying hi, like it knows that it is known. Consciousness, awareness, 
intention, and the ability to carry out designs and desires are a force in the universe capable of creating real change in its arrangement. There are multiple places in this game that will teach you how to engage with uncertainty and make it certain. We can learn how to use this power that we don't just wield, that we kind of are. Then, maybe in the same way that the forces of physics, time, and chance sent the interloper to wipe out the Nomai, the same way whatever dark bramble is wound up here, maybe the forces of knowing and intention can manipulate enough of the situation, the factors of potential that just need to be cajoled by an influence to change what is true, the kind of force that changes the course of a ship at the excitement of learning something that notices an inconsistency in the nature of the universe, that constructs this big wacky Rube Goldberg-like system to accomplish something that should have been impossible, that somehow stops the universe from ending just long enough that there can be a witness to its catastrophic natural finale, who dares to ask what if, that will push the limits of every angle of its own potential to realize not just its own capability, but that of the universe itself, going as far as space and time will let it. The kind of force that will remember and record for future generations of explorers, that puts little crystals in their ships to bend the rules and fight against the misanthropic space around them, that might just find a way to stand at the end, watch the universe fade away into nothing, and then say, I'm still here. The cosmic existential horror of Outer Wilds is no accident. It's a game that explores ultimate endings and mandatory death, but never hesitates to provide a contrast, to refute the hopelessness that comes with those endings. For every time we have to stare down the death of a star, taking everything and everyone down with it, there is a moment where we can talk with a friend at home and make plans to relax sometime tomorrow where we can sit by a fire and roast a marshmallow, listening to a friend whistling a nice tune, where we can watch the cosmic ballet from the safety of a space we have carved out of the deep, terrifying nothingness out there. The prevalence of the image of the campfire might be the game's strongest statement. There is room for a light in the dark. Even if it is small, there can be a modest beacon of comfort and safety in spite of how terrifying the prospect of being there, anywhere, when you consider it, really is. Something I didn't talk about in the Mist video is that back when I was just seven years old, first playing Mist on my family's old Macintosh, I was scared of the game. I'm not entirely sure that's the ideal word to use, because at that age I was kind of just unsure about a lot of stuff back then, but it's the simplest word to use in this case. It really freaked me out how quiet the game was, both literally and thematically. It was the first game I played that didn't just have you move to the right to proceed. You could go anywhere you wanted to, and it was up to you to go anywhere. There was no one and nothing telling you anything specific. It seemed so big and in a way empty that my young imagination ran in every direction it could, and it got to be kind of overwhelming. The game is just waiting for you, as though it's hiding around the corner, ready to jump out and scare you. What's more, the puzzles were pretty tough, and that's its own kind of despair. This is the root of why I decided to do this series on puzzle games. It's kind of a funny thought, but Myst might have been my first existential crisis. Something my young mind had to parse and learn how to interpret, eventually giving way to the kind of experience that I crave. I got hooked on a mode of play that values the simple act of being there and making your presence mean something, something I got to explore further in Riven and The Witness, each from their own perspective. Outer Wilds is what crystallized this feeling for me, both in the themes it wrestles with and the gameplay legacy it adapts and yet preserves. It hits all the same notes and essential ideas as these old favorites, only to build itself around those feelings of uncertainty and unknowing that I first felt years back, fully realized and now made dangerous and important. That's what these games mean to me, what a game like this has the potential to say. There can be order and understanding in something that seems overwhelming to us. It's life-affirming for me, in spite of the cavernous anxiety these games are capable of creating. 
showing me how I fit into something that might seem terrifying at first glance on some deeper level. There might be things out there we will never understand, whether they are truths of the far-flung galaxy or the wills of the planet around us, but if Outer Wilds can teach us anything, it's that there's room in the universe for a calming campfire and time for a moment to sit and relax, just knowing that the stars are beautiful.